Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, uh, and welcome to the 2001 Hinton Lecture, the premier lecture of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, this lecture honours the late Lord Hinton of Bankside, the Academy's first president, at a time it was established in 1976. Lord Hinton was one of the 20th century's most eminent and honoured engineers, making an enormous contribution both to the development of energy generation technology and in later life to politics as an active member of the House of Lords. Traditionally, the Hinton Lecture has been used to recognise outstanding achievements in engineering or to address major issues faced by the engineering community. And it's with both these thoughts in mind that our guest lecturer tonight is Bob Dudley. Now, Bob is an engineer... Uh, having graduated from the University of Illinois in chemical engineering. Uh, and uh, he uh, first, I first met him uh, during the merger of BP and Amico. I asked uh, my opposite number, uh, Larry Fuller, the CEO of Amico, a very simple question. Wh who is the person I should uh, look after most carefully and who would best come and work uh, and run my own office as my executive assistant. The answer was Bob Dudley, uh, and if I may say so, I made a very good choice. Uh, he uh, subsequently did many things, but he served as president and chief executive of TNKBP, and on, uh, in June of 2010 was assigned to be the BP executive in charge of the Gulf Coast Restoration Organization, responding to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. He became CEO of BP in uh, 2010, on October the 1st. Uh, in this year's Hinton Lecture, Bob will trace the evolution of engineering and technology in the energy industry and examine some of the challenges it faces today. So before I hand over to Bob, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those at BP who've so generously supported the Academy's work over these many years, many of whom are here tonight. Whether through the commitment of Academy Fellows connected to BP, support of advanced research programs, or the Academy's activities to enhance engineering in further education, BP's commitment to excellence at all, excellence at all levels of engineering is remarkable. Uh, not to make this sound too domestic as well, uh, I did ask uh, one of our most distinguished fellows, uh, Sir Robert Malpas, what we might do tonight, and he came up with the very brilliant idea of inviting the past CEOs of BP and other board members to this event. So I think uh, we have here Sir Peter Walters, Sir Robert Horton, and uh, both uh, former chairman and CEOs, it was before the complexities of corporate governance, uh, and uh, there were other uh, board members here, Sir Peter Caslett, Sir Robert Malpas, Dick Oliver, and Basil Butler. So, all in all, we have four out of the six uh, CEOs of BP. Two couldn't make it tonight, and they send their apologies. So, Bob, over to you to give us the lecture. Well, thank you very much, John, and good evening, everyone. It is, it is very much an honor and a real privilege to deliver a lecture that tracks the history of some of the great engineering challenges of the energy industry right through to today's challenges in such a historic spot. Uh, I saw the, the oil painting outside, Mr. Faraday, who did his experiments here. It is, uh, it's, I've heard about it. It's great to be here. I'm conscious that, as John said, there are a number of previous BP executives and board members here. It is good to see many old friends. And I've met a few tonight for the first time, Bob Horton, Peter Cazalet, and several others. So welcome to you all. I appreciate that this is a significant event in the Academy's year, and I hope that what I have to share with you tonight about the challenges of the energy frontiers is worthy of the occasion. I believe that the subject matter is certainly appropriate because Lord Hinton of Bankside, the first president of the Academy, for whom this lecture's name, was himself a pioneer of engineering at the frontiers of energy. 
Engineering makes progress through small steps as well as by step changes driven by events such as research breakthroughs, technologies, technologies developed in wartime, and the lessons from specific incidents. In Lord Hinton's case, the challenges were those of moving from the development of atomic weapons in the Second World War to providing energy for post-war Britain. And one way in which those challenges were met was by engineers who made nuclear-based power a reality. Hinton led the development of nuclear power in the UK, and that included the construction and operation of the wind-scale nuclear reactors. In 1957, one of those reactors had a serious accident, and that led to important changes in the regulation of the industry. In particular, it became incumbent upon operators to provide a safety case for that facility, for each facility. So, ladies and gentlemen, the experience of your first president could not be more relevant to what I want to say tonight, because I want to look at the way engineering and technology have helped our industry to meet demand as well as to manage risk, which includes implementing the lessons learned from accidents. You are aware that we experienced a very serious accident last year in the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, its anniversary falls next Wednesday. We deeply regret what happened, and I will explain the changes we're making in BP and commending to the industry in the way we manage risk on the frontiers of energy. I'm going to look at the evolution of engineering challenges over three distinct eras in our industry. I'll start with the early days of onshore exploration and production, then move to offshore drilling and the progression to deep water activity. In that context, I'll cover the Deepwater Horizon accident and its lessons. I'll then conclude by looking beyond these three areas, eras to the next frontier and the next generation of engineering challenges. What we will see is, first, how demand has driven the industry to operate at more and more testing frontiers. Second, how engineering, making the best use of emerging technologies, has delivered more and more ingenious solutions to find and produce oil and gas at those frontiers. And third, how new challenges and new operating environments, as well as setbacks, have increased our risk awareness and caused us to add more and more levels of protection in our work. In all of this, what we are examining is frontier engineering. From an engineering perspective, the term frontier implies more than simple geography or remoteness, such as we see in the Arctic, for example. It can also simply mean being the first to work in an uncharted natural environment, such as the deep water or complex rock formations. This introduces a unique element of engineering risk. The essence of frontier engineering is the way in which that risk is managed and in particular, the extent to which it requires the use of newly created technology. <coughs> For some industries, crossing new frontiers is a matter of choice. They could, if they wish, choose to continue to work with current technologies. But for oil and gas, crossing new frontiers is a matter of necessity. To get the energy we need as a society, our industry needs to go to new places and face new challenges. That means we have to design new technologies and standards using our experience and what we can learn about the new environment before we start operating. Sometimes we find we have built in more safeguards that are needed, and at other times we discover something we did not know and we have to create a new and better design. So let's start with a brief look at some milestones from the first era of oil production for BP and the industry. I'll look in more detail at some of these in a moment. It all began in 1859 with the oil well commonly regarded as the first of the industry in a place called Titusville, Pennsylvania. This was drilled to the stunning depth of 71 feet by Colonel Edward Drake, who incidentally was not a colonel at all, but an unemployed railroad conductor. In fact, Drake did not discover oil. It's been used for thousands of years by native peoples around the world, particularly for medicine. What Drake developed was a method for producing large quantities of oil. 
And once the oil was found, the business of drilling oil wells was not for the faint-hearted or those without deep pockets. Back then, explorers knew very little about what was going on under the ground. They typically relied on what they could see, which was oil seeping out of the ground. When they drilled, they had little idea whether they were hitting the edge or the center of a reservoir, and that was only the beginning. Developers had to think about building the roads, the pipelines, often across deserts and hostile areas to get the oil to refineries and processing units. These are the early days of drilling in Azerbaijan, and here is a person being winched out of a well covered in oil where he had been working without any protective clothing. The conditions were primitive with oil seeping and sloshing around on the surface. Initially, the operators used something called percussion drilling in which you just punch a hole in the ground with a heavy bit. Rotary drilling was introduced around the turn of the last century and gradually became the industry standard. And then once a field was opened up, wells were sunk all over the place and ended up with the forest of wells, as you could see. BP's UK heritage goes back to an industrialist called William Darcy. He made his fortune in the Australian gold mines and then poured a considerable amount of into it in searching for oil in Persia. By 1908, things were looking bleak, but he had an engineer called George Reynolds who didn't want to give up, and on the 26th of May of that year, this happened. Shut it down. Shut it down, lovely. Shut it down. That was a reconstruction of 103 years ago of the oil strike at Majidi Suleiman, which was part of a film made for BP's centenary. Despite being symbols of newfound wealth, blowouts or gushers were dangerous. They killed workmen, destroyed equipment, and coated the landscape with thousands of barrels of oil. Initially, drilling in this field was carried out by using a steam-powered cable tool percussion rig. We have a replica of a percussion drill somewhere here tonight. And then in 1922, which was quite early for the industry, the first two rotary rigs were used in the field. This reduced the risk of the gushers as mud and cement could then be used to control the pressures of the well. And in 1924 came along an example of an innovation driven by risk management. This was the first blowout preventer, or BOP. It's been in the news a lot this year. It was a ram-type device with simple hydrostatic pistons fixed to the wellhead. These could be closed on the drill stem to form a seal against escaping well pressure. And as the technology developed, blowout preventers became standard equipment. Modern BOPs have automated mode function or something called dead men circuits that are designed to cut in without human intervention if needed. And it is an example of how engineering has sought to reduce the risks. One of the first frontier engineering challenges in BP's history was the building of the pipeline from that first discovery to the site of the new refinery at Abadan, now Iran, 220 kilometers to the south. The pipeline was built through two ranges of hills across a desert plain using up to 6,000 mules, over 1,000 local and Indian laborers, 140 miles of pipe in 20-foot lengths were imported from New York and transmitted ported to the site by river barge. So even at this early stage, we can see that our industry really involves three sets of processes, or three phases. Exploration, to find the oil or the gas. Development, to drill the wells and build the projects. And production, to bring the reserves from the reservoir to the market. And there are diverse technologies involved in each of these phases. 
we're always exploring ahead of production. And this often means creating new technologies, standards, and design codes to meet the challenges presented by each new frontier. We assess the risks and design our equipment and practices using a combination of experience, calculation, sound engineering, and science. But the basic components of drilling have remained similar for over 150 years. Let's move on down the timeline to the second of the eras I want to discuss this evening. And this is the progression from onshore to offshore drilling. Here we can see a number of significant milestones from the first era of offshore drilling running from the post-war years up to the late 1980s. And these include developments in the North Sea, which was a real frontier for the industry. The potential to recover oil from beneath the ocean had been understood for decades. Indeed, wells had been drilled from piers in California as early as 1896. The concept of using piers was taken to a totally new level in Azerbaijan, in a place known as Oily Rocks near Baku. This extraordinary development started with a single path out over the water in 1948 and grew into an entire city at sea. It has 190 miles of streets and it has a population that has been as high as 5,000. It includes houses, schools, libraries, and shops. It is amazing. It's no surprise it's been used in a setting for a James Bond film. But a definitive frontier was crossed in 1947 when engineers from a company called Kermagee, an American oil company, drilled the very first well that was completed out of the sight of land. It was located 10 miles off the coast of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico, and the drilling deck was no bigger than a tennis court. Alongside, it had refurbished Navy barges, which served for storage and sleeping quarters. The well was drilled from a single derrick into the deep waters of 15 feet. At this time, firms were choosing steel over wooden structures. They recognized that the metal had greater structural integrity and lower cost over the life of a structure. The history of the offshore industry has been marked by successive generations of drilling rigs able to operate at greater depths and harsher conditions. The first offshore rigs were semi-submersibles with pontoons that were flooded with water and literally sat on the seabed. Then in the 1950s, jack-up rigs were developed. These were towed to the drill site and jacked up so their legs rested on the seafloor. They could operate in around 300 feet of water. The 1960s saw the introduction of the first semi-submersible rigs. These floated on the sea surface while maintaining their position using anchors and tension chains. Initially, they could only operate in shallow water, but now the industry is using fifth and sixth generation semi-submersibles in combination with advanced dynamically positioned systems. These allow the floating structures to hold and adjust their position using thrusters constantly, which are essentially sophisticated propellers. And this currently allows drilling in water depths of up to 10,000 feet or more. In addition, the industry uses drill ships. These are most often used in deep water and have the advantage of being able to move from place to place rapidly. They currently have a typical reach of around 8,000 feet. In October 1970, BP discovered the Forties Field, some 110 miles east of Aberdeen, using the company's first semi-submersible rig called the Sequest. The Forties had 2.5 billion barrels of recoverable reserves and was the largest field in the UK sector. From an engineering perspective, what made Forties challenging was not so much its size as its location. It was located in a water depth of 400 feet in an area with much more severe weather conditions than the industry had experienced anywhere in the world. The 100-year maximum design wave height exceeded 90 feet, almost twice the design height used previously in offshore engineering. Persistent bad weather throughout most of the year meant that the metal fatigue became an overriding design consideration. With only a brief summer season for offshore construction, a new approach was required for platform and topsides installation. Ladies and gentlemen, this was truly the frontiers of our industry. Many of you here will remember those days well, and I know that some of you were directly involved. 
Here is how the energy minister at the time, Tony Benn, welcomed the start of production. I haven't come here to make a policy statement. I think this must be a day of uh, celebration, a day of congratulation to the firms and to the people who have brought this oil ashore from under the most uh, terrifying and capricious waters in the world. Everything about 40s was on a giant scale for its time, often exceeding the then current industry, current industry practice by sometimes two or three times. Many of the existing codes and design rules no longer applied, and new ones were created from first principles along with new technology. The field was developed using four massive steel jackets built in a specially constructed fabrication yard in Scotland. The export pipeline back to the beach also broke all industry records in terms of water depth and size. It was the first offshore pipeline to be constructed using fully automated welding and the first to be designed to resist propagating buckles. Over the next 15 years, BP and other companies continued to develop fields in the North Sea. They expanded beyond the 40s field and produced both oil and gas. This shows some of the BP fields that grew over the years. Oil and gas production in the UK peaked in 1999 at around 4.5 million barrels of oil and gas per day. And today's production is running around 2.4 million barrels a day. I remember all of this very well. I started working in the North Sea in 1985, and I spent three years based in Aberdeen, mainly working offshore at the time. And it really was the most exciting place to work in our industry. Over the years, platform design became more sophisticated, and jackets no longer needed to be quite so massive. Let me end this section by moving ahead to 1988 when one of the defining events of the offshore industry took place. And sadly, it was a dreadful accident. The Piper Alpha platform was located on the Piper oil field, approximately 120 miles northeast of Aberdeen and 474 feet of water. And on the 6th of July, 1988, Piper Alpha suffered a massive leakage of gas condensate. The leak gas ignited, causing an explosion which led to a large oil fire and a fireball that engulfed the platform. This tragic accident killed 167 people and only 67 workers survived. An inquiry under Lord Cullen made over 100 recommendations that led to widespread changes in industry practice and regulation. Responsibility for safety was transferred from the government's energy department to the health and safety executive, HSE. That separated the oversight for production from the oversight of safety. The disaster led to energy companies conducting wide-ranging assessments of their installations and their systems for integrity management. Operators invested around one billion pounds in safety measures such as the work permit management system. And as a result of the report, the offshore installation safety case regulations came into force in 1992. These applied the same safety case principle for the UK offshore sector as had been applied to the nuclear sector after wind scale. And by the following year, a safety case for every UK offshore installation had been submitted to the HSE. Let's now move on to the deep water story of the past two decades. Over that period, demand for oil and gas has grown relentlessly. In broad terms, the world's consumption has risen from around 30 million barrels a day of oil in 1965 to 60 million barrels a day in 1980 and is now 85 million barrels a day. Early fields have become mature and production from some basins has peaked and the North Sea is one example. Geopolitical factors have also been at work. National oil companies in many countries have dominated the easier fields on shore. Meanwhile, the international oil companies have had to set their sights on more challenging environments. In 1970, over 80% of global reserves were controlled by international oil companies. Today, the figure is closer to 8%. So companies like BP, we have to develop our skills at the very difficult frontiers. We are now increasingly moving back into partnerships with national oil companies as they start to work at new frontiers on their own, and we can contribute what we've learned. In 1975, 
shell found in the cognac field in the Gulf of Mexico. It was the first to be discovered in over 1,000 feet of water. But progress in developing deep water fields was slow due to the challenges of locating reservoirs and developing rig and riser technologies. The challenges the industry has faced in deep water are tremendous. The sea can be over 5,000 feet. The oil itself can be as much as 35,000 feet below the sea level through miles of hard rock, thick salt, and tightly packed sands. We are operating hundreds of miles from shore at subsea pressures of over 2,000 pounds per square inch and water temperatures below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Exploration of these depths, to quote the New York Times, is like flying 30,000 feet above New York City and aiming a drill tip the size of a coffee can at the pitcher's mound at Yankee Stadium in the dark. Yet these are the challenges that the industry has surmounted through technology breakthroughs and engineering expertise. By 2009, the industry had drilled some 4,000 wells in over 1,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico alone. In the year 2000, deep water production in the U.S. surpassed shallow water production. And by 2008, more oil had been found in the deep water than the shallow water and onshore combined. This progress has been driven by engineering and technology, including some massive new floating rigs. Equipment has to be installed and maintained at depths no human diver can ever reach. As a result, a whole new subsea engineering sector has grown up in making and operating the robot submarines that act as our hands and eyes. In the industry, we call them remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs. However, one of the most important advances for deep water activity was not in the hardware of production, but in the software of exploration. This advance concerned seismic imaging. Seismic technology involves sending sound waves into the ground from so-called shot points, where they are reflected off of rock layers, with the resulting signals being picked up by using receivers called geophones or hydrophones. And by analyzing the ways the signal bounces off the various geologic layers beneath the surface, seismologists can identify patterns that indicate potential oil and gas reservoirs. Early seismic surveys on land used dynamite to create the sound waves and operate in straight lines, producing two-dimensional images. And then seismic imaging came into its own in the 1980s and the 1990s with the emergence of 3D seismic methods that used shot point grids in, arranged in a grid, and this coincided with a dramatic increase in computer power for processing the data. At sea, the 3D seismic surveys have been typically carried out using a vessel towing 8 to 10 parallel streamers, each several kilometers long. The vessel has a seismic source that creates sound waves using blasts of compressed air, and the signals are then detected by the hydrophones incorporated into the streamers. In basins such as the Gulf of Mexico and offshore Brazil and Angola, this process can be impeded by what salt canopies that cover many of the reservoirs. The salt surfaces have irregular shapes and the seismic reflections go in all directions and create a confusing picture. And this issue has now been overcome to a degree by acquiring 3D data in a so-called wide azimuth survey, which involves multiple seismic sources and receiver vessels which illuminate the reservoirs below the salt. This method was pioneered by BP in 2005 on the Mad Dog Field in the Gulf of Mexico. And the industry is imaginative in the names of its oil fields. This is the kind of image we produce. It shows the Atlantis Reservoir in the Gulf of Mexico lying beneath the salt, which is the orange area. You can also see the paths taken by the wells. At this point, it may be helpful to remind ourselves of what is involved in drilling a deep water well. Some of you will be very familiar with this, but it helps to provide the terms of reference for what I'll cover in the remainder of my remarks. First, we deploy a large diameter drill bit to the seabed and drill the first section of the well. We then sink a cylindrical conductor into the first section of the well. Cement is pumped down this conductor, which then rises up to fill the annular space between the well and the rock. Drilling then starts again using a small diameter bit and another section of holes drilled. 
Then a steel casing is inserted into the conductor and the new well section and cementing is repeated, closing in the spaces between the casing and the newly drilled rock and the conductor. A wellhead and blowout preventer are then fitted at the top of the first section of the casing on the seabed. By the way, these things are, can be four stories high and weigh 400 tons. A riser pipe is connected to the top of the blowout preventer connecting the well to the drilling rig. The drilling, casing, and cementing process is then repeated using narrower and narrower casings in a telescopic structure until the reservoir, hopefully, is penetrated. The result is a closed system designed to have full integrity. If the well is to be used for production, the bottom of the casing is perforated to enable hydrocarbons to flow into the well from the reservoir. Alternatively, the well can be abandoned, either permanently or temporarily for future use. In this case, cement is pumped to various locations within the well to create multiple effective seals. Pressure tests are carried out to ensure that the system has integrity. Now, over the past few decades in BP, we've been moving into deeper and deeper water with more powerful rigs and platforms. BP's journey into deep water began as we built on what we learned in the 40s field. We took a major step forward with the development of the Fornaven field west of the Shetlands. Fornaven remains the largest subsea development in the UK with over 30 wells. This kind of experience then gave the company the confidence to tackle the giant fields off Angola and in the Gulf of Mexico. And the strategy paid off handsomely in the 1999 to 2000 period when BP made four world-class discoveries in the Gulf of Mexico, Holstein, Mad Dog, Thunder Horse, and Atlantis, each of which set a number of world firsts. And over the same period, a series of important deepwater discoveries were also made in Angola, including the greater plutonium field. Here's a seismic image of the Atlantis field in the Gulf of Mexico. As you can see, it lies on a subsea cliff, which drops from approximately 4,500 feet of water depth to 7,000 feet. So that cliff face is over five times the height of the White Cliffs of Dover. The task for engineers was to drill wells at a variety of depths in this topography and then link them together, tying them all back to one platform. Atlantis has no less than 150 separate substantial subsea components, including flow lines, manifolds, trees, and umbilicals. The production rig fabricated to produce oil from Atlantis is a 58,000-ton semi-submersible platform, which is tethered to the seabed over 7,000 feet below. And for a few months in 2007, Atlantis was the deepest moored platform in the world. But the record did not last long. In 2008, Shell's Perdido Spar, in which BP has a stake, was chained to the seabed nearly 8,000 feet down. But the depth of the water is only one frontier. Another is the depth of the reservoir, which can be several miles below the seabed. Other factors, again, the high temperatures and high pressures. If you have a very deep reservoir and you are planning to use a series of complex systems, then you need a very large platform to carry the weight. So meet Thunder Horse. What made the Thunder Horse field unique was not the depth of the water at around 6,300 feet, but the depth of the oil, which was a further 20,000 feet down, where the reservoir pressures were as high as 18,000 pounds per square inch. To produce oil from this field, BP constructed the largest production semi-submersible ever built. The platform's topside area is the size of three football fields, contains equipment and systems capable of processing a quarter of a million barrels of oil, equivalent per day, from just over 20 wells. It involved many new technologies and their design, testing, construction, required a whole new generation of subsea equipment. Just as in the 40s and other situations, there was a strong emphasis on design standards for the new technology, building at a very high safety thresholds and levels of redundancy from the beginning. So when Hurricane Dennis hit the rig in July 2005, there was no damage to the hull. There was a failure in the ballast system, which allowed water to freely move among the ballast tanks and caused the platform to list. It was righted within a week, 
And when it was hit by Hurricane Katrina, shortly afterwards, it weathered the storm. Later, another problem arose when a failed weld was discovered in the subsea metallurgy. The decision was taken to replace all of the subsea equipment, a major exercise that required 14 vessels in operation simultaneously. The learning from this incident led us to upgrade our monitoring of parameters such as wind speed, ocean currents, and vessel movements. The restoration work was completed and First Oil was received on Thunder Horse in June 2008. These issues again demonstrated the challenges and the achievements of operating beyond previous frontiers. There were also major advances in the scale and the sophistication of subsea pipeline systems developed to carry oil and gas from the fields to the processing hubs on shore. And something called the Mardi Gras deep water transportation system in the Gulf of Mexico is the largest capacity deep water oil and gas pipeline system ever built capable of transporting over 1 million barrels of oil equivalent a day through 800 kilometers of pipeline. This brings us to the Deepwater Horizon rig and the tragic accident that occurred last year. In September 2009, the rig had drilled the deepest well in the history of the industry at something called the Tiber Field. That was a well was 35,000 feet deep or nearly seven miles below the Earth's surface. The Deepwater Horizon had also drilled wells at the Atlantis and the Thunder Horse fields in the Gulf that you saw a moment ago. Then in April 2010, the Deepwater Horizon was drilling at the Macondo Prospect, approximately 50 miles off the coast of Louisiana, when a blowout took place. Hydrocarbons escaped from the well, resulting in explosions and a fire that burned for two days until the rig sank. 126 people were on board. Tragically, 11 men lost their lives and others were injured. Hydrocarbons continued to flow for the well for, for 87 days, causing a major oil spill. We deeply regret this accident. Several investigations have been conducted, some of which have already published reports. These include our own BP investigation, in which internal and external experts participated. They include the report of the President's National Commission and a specific report for the U.S. government on the blowout preventer. Both the Presidential Commission and our own internal investigation concluded that the accident was a result of multiple causes involving multiple parties. Several factors stand out in the findings of these reports. The cement at the bottom of the well did not seal off the hydrocarbons in the formation. A negative pressure test to diagnose whether there was a seal was misinterpreted. And the blowout preventer did not seal the well at the seabed it is clear that the blind shear rams did not close. The precise cause of that failure is still being discussed just last week at hearings in New Orleans, and it is the subject of additional testing for which a framework is being discussed with the court. Our own investigation made 26 recommendations covering issues including blowout preventers, pressure tests, and cement testing. And the Presidential Commission made wide-ranging recommendations for government and industry on areas ranging from risk management to planning for oil spill response. We are now systematically implementing the lessons from the incident across BP. Clearly, the event left us in a state of shock and grief, but the imperative was to respond, seal the well, tackle the oil spill, and help those affected. That meant that together with the U.S. states and the federal government departments and agencies, we mounted a major crisis response. At its peak, it involved 48,000 people, 6,500 vessels, and 125 aircraft. That phase is now over, but we are still very much in action in the Gulf, meeting legitimate claims and fulfilling our commitments to the Gulf Coast communities. In terms of engineering, the effort to stop the flow of oil meant working fast to enhance existing technologies and develop some new ones. Never before had anyone experienced a blowout at a depth of more than 5,000 feet, and over $200 million was spent on research and development by BP alone just during the response. We deployed a range of measures with increasing success. Within 12 days of the accident, we began work on drilling a relief well that would permanently stop the leak and a backup relief well was started two weeks later. 
We employed multiple techniques to contain the leak, collecting oil in open water, using containment systems that piped off oil to vessels on the surface, and ultimately sealing the well by fitting a capping stack on top of it. This graphic gives you some sense of the complexity of the operations. You can see two rigs drilling the relief wells, two vessels collecting oil. You can also see robot subs suspended from the vessels on the surface. These were often moving around, performing complex operations, which had to be carefully choreographed in advance. These technologies were developed at extraordinary speed. The containment systems, for example, were created in three months, when the norm would have been around two years. In order to make the containment and then the sealing cap work, we needed to cut the broken riser pipe. And as you can see from this film clip, it involved using a giant pair of shears operated by ROVs exerting massive pressure at exactly the right spot. And there you can see the oil flowing out of, at the moment that the riser was cut. Once the riser was cut, we were able to capture a large volume of oil, pipe it to vessels on the surface. You can see them here. They are the Discover Enterprise and the Q4000. And then when we had built an effective capping stack, we first placed a transition spool over the wellhead and then lowered the stack into place. Here we see the footage of the moments when the well was finally capped. Here you can see the ceiling cap being lowered onto the spool and ultimately stopping the flow. You can see the mechanical arm of the robot sub guiding the stack into place. The robot sub operators were some of the real heroes of the response. That was on July 15th last year. Meanwhile, we continued with the drilling of two relief wells. The relief well had to be drilled with precision to intersect the Macondo well at exactly the right point deep beneath the seabed. With oil leaking for 87 days, there was a large-scale effort to prevent it from reaching land and then to find it, clean it up on the shore and where it did come ashore. The response involved applying dispersant onto the oil at the surface, applying dispersant underwater, skimming oil from the surface, burning it on the seabed and on the sea surface, and we laid nearly 13 million feet, or 2,500 miles of boom, and deploying thousands of people to clear oil from beaches and marshes. In the communities, we set up claim centers to reimburse those who had suffered losses, and we have now paid out over $5 billion to individuals, businesses, governments, and for environmental restoration. We've learned a tremendous amount from our experiences and the findings of the various investigations over the past 12 months. We would not wish the same on anyone ever again, and that is why we are accepting the invitations we have been offered to share what we have learned everywhere. And we have shared the lessons with industry and regulators in 20 countries around the world. We've organized the lessons into five areas, prevention, containment, relief wells, spill response, and crisis management. In terms of prevention, for example, we've been systematically reviewing risk management plans for every one of BP's wells and enhancing our practices in areas such as cementing and well integrity testing. Aside from the practical and engineering lessons, we're responding to the events of last year in ways that will embed changes within all of BP's businesses worldwide. Let me outline just a few of the main elements of the program. We formed a powerful central safety and operational risk organization headed by Mark Bly, who led our internal investigation of the accident. Mark reports directly to me and sits on our executive team. His organization has the resources and the mandate to drive safe, reliable, and compliant operations. It includes the ability to intervene in BP's operations anywhere in the world to bring around corrective action. We're already seeing results. We've halted operations where concerns have been raised by our staff, and we have turned away drilling rigs or required modifications where they would not conform to our new standards. The new organization has over 500 safety and risk specialists who work alongside our operational managers. We've appointed people with deep experience in this safety and risk management to key roles in the organization. For example, John Baxter, our group head of engineering and process safety, is here tonight. John. In his capacity as a fellow of this academy, John is also former director of the UK Atomic Energy Authority's Dunray and Windscale sites, two of the sites Lord Hinton built. 
We've also made changes in our structure, introducing three divisions in the upstream, exploration, developments, and production. This creates greater, greater clarity and accountability as well as bringing specialists together into teams where they can build their capability. All of our wells are now drilled by a single global wells organization to drive standardization of process and consistency of implementation of drilling worldwide. And we're conducting a major review of our risk management system and are linking our performance management and reward systems even more directly to safety and risk management, compliance with standards and long-term goals. In taking these initiatives, we are drawing on lessons from other industries where safety and risk management have been developed to world-class levels. One of these is the U.S. Nuclear Navy, which was identified by the Presidential Commission on the Deepwater Horizon Accident as a leader in safety. I'm very pleased that we now have as a board member Admiral Skip Bowman, who served as the director of the U.S. Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. Strengthening safety and earning trust are the foundations of which we will build a new value proposition for BP, designed to create value for the long term in a manner that is safe and sustainable. Let me conclude with a look ahead to the wider task that we have as an industry, which is to provide the energy needed to meet the world's growing demand for fuel and power. By 2030, according to our forecasts, we estimate that the world could be consuming around 40% more energy than today. To put that in perspective, that is the equivalent of two new United States is entering the demand uh, world. This represents our best estimate according to current trends in demand, supply, as well as policy and economic factors. In this scenario, an incredible 93% of the increase in demand is set to come from emerging economies, while consumption in the OECD world will remain relatively flat. This slide shows how that plays out in the cases of North America, Europe, and China. These are all on the same scale. As you can see, the projected growth in Chinese demand is staggering, while the mature industrialized economies show little growth in consumption. And that pattern that you see on the right is characteristic of many fast-growing emerging economies, as well as China. Whatever happens, energy will have to come from many different sources. We expect continued reliance on oil, but with new growth met increasingly by gas and renewables, and we also have to recognize that on current trends, a lot of China's energy growth will come from coal. Many of you will note that such a trajectory implies significant greenhouse gas emissions, and we have described it as a wake-up call to policymakers. As you may know, BP supports policy action to address climate change and encourage low-carbon energy. That action would include a widely applied carbon price and transitional incentives to help low-carbon technologies compete with fossil fuels. So there we have the demand, but what about the supply to meet it? Let's look at fossil fuels first. This map indicates where we currently know about onshore oil and gas basins around the world. The basins are in green. And here we see the offshore basins in purple. Some of these resources have not been found or yet exploited. Many of the basins shown here are already mature or declining now. So the industry faces a series of challenges. First, we need to maximize production from the developed fields. Despite all that, the industry has achieved recovery rates for the existing fields of oil are typically only under 50%. It's a lot of oil left behind. Second, much of the undeveloped resources located in the Arctic. And that poses unique challenges for engineers. Third, we will need to continue to probe the deep water. As you can see, hydrocarbons are often located in continental shelves and around the mouths of river systems where fossils have accumulated. And I'll come back to those points in a moment. And fourth, we need to look beyond the so-called conventional resources to the unconventional resources that require very different production techniques. Unconventional oil includes the heavy oils found in Canada and Venezuela that can be extracted by surface mining or as the, in the business we invest in through a technique called steam-assisted gravity drainage, which has a minimal environmental footprint for heavy oil. Unconventional gas includes 
gas from shales and tight gas, which is trapped in very complex rock formations. Producing this gas requires advanced technologies, such as 3D seismic, horizontal wells, angled wells, and new ways of fracturing the rock. Advances in this area have revolutionized America's gas production in the past decade. <clears throat> then beyond fossil fuels entirely, we have low carbon energy, including renewables. With fossil fuels, Mother Nature has done us a huge favor of concentrating sunlight into accumulations underground, which is why oil and gas and coal have a huge cost advantage over the alternatives. Renewables have a relatively high cost of collection because the sources have low energy density and require large areas of smaller scale facilities, such as wind turbines and solar panels. However, we are now seeing significant technology advantages with certain renewables, which are now making them cost competitive with fossil fuels. This would include, for example, ethanol made with Brazilian sugarcane. And BP is focusing its low carbon investments in areas where we can build competitive and material businesses, such as biofuels and wind. Wind power has been a great success story for engineers as they have created bigger and more powerful turbines, often incentivized by policy. Back in 1998, the American government projected that the country's wind capacity would be 4 gigawatts by 2020. Last year alone, in 2010, it already stood at 10 times that capacity at over 40 gigawatts. I read that there was one day a few months ago where the entire power demand of Spain was provided by wind power. BP is playing a role in wind, building a fast-growing wind business in the U.S. And the renewable sector can make use of the capabilities developed in the oil and gas sector. For example, geothermal energy and carbon capture, which will both require subsurface capability. And biofuels have a similar physical supply chain to gasoline, except they begin with a field of hydrocarbons above the ground rather than basins fossilized hard of hydrocarbons below it. Biofuels vary in terms of how sustainable they are. Our policy in BP is to focus on what we call biofuels done well. And that means developing biofuels that are low carbon and sustainably produced, as well as capable of being delivered at scale and being competitive with liquid fuels. For example, BP is planning to strengthen its already significant position in sugarcane ethanol in Brazil and in developing a position in the southeastern U.S. for the production of lignocellulosic ethanol. Nuclear power, of course, has its own set of opportunities and challenges, being much debated now in light of the Japanese crisis, a subject, I think, for another presentation. So in this last part of the remarks, I want to look at the first three of the challenges I just referred to. First, I mentioned the need to increase recovery rates from existing fields. And this is not about new developments, but about introducing new technology to well-established fields. Worldwide, approximately one trillion barrels of oil and gas has been produced so far. But roughly twice that amount has been left behind in reservoirs. If recovery factors could be increased by just 5%, we estimate we would provide enough resources for 10 to 20 years consumption at today's production rates. So enhanced oil recovery, or EOR, is very important. One major location where we've been testing is at BP's Prudhoe Bay operation here in Alaska, part of which you can see. And EOR technologies have increased the recovery factor from the original estimates of around 40% to more than 50%. These technologies include horizontal drilling, coil tubing drilling, and gas cap water injection. And we now anticipate we can push those recovery rates to over 60%. And the new generation of EOR technologies work in new ways. Reservoir management over the past 100 years has been mainly about large-scale physics, drilling wells and displacing fluids in porous media. But we're now developing mechanisms that work at the molecular scale. One example is BP's Brightwater technology, which was developed in partnership with Nalco and Chevron. This technology approves the impact of injecting water into the reservoirs to recover more oil. And the problem with this has been making sure that the water simply doesn't channel along a few high permeability pathways. Bright water is a polymer which we add to injection water and it blocks the zones that have been swept already and diverts the water into the unswept zones. It's very simple, but it's effective. 
Looking at the second challenge, Arctic drilling takes place offshore, and that creates numerous challenges relating to ice. These images show the narrow band of water that exists between the land, in this case Alaska, and Canada, and the ice sheet. Seasonally, this opens wider, but it closes off completely during many months of the year. That means that projects have to be built rapidly and then secured so they can be left during the months when they are surrounded by ice. There is also an environmental concern because a spill could lead to oil trapped below the ice for months. One solution has been to drill from gravel islands, for example, in the Beaufort Sea off Alaska. Joint industry engineering development programs have been undertaken here. They've covered ice mechanics, the designs of the islands, the construction of mobile drilling units, and techniques for installing pipelines through the ice. This is the Endicott Island development, which was the first continually producing offshore oil field in the Arctic. Drill ships are also used in these conditions. The North Star development in the Beaufort Sea came on stream in 2001. This was the first year all-round all offshore Arctic production with no causeway link back to the shore. But I think this is only the start. There is much to do, and we will make further advances in drilling and production and manage the risks required to help us protect the Arctic environment. Third challenge I mentioned was moving into deeper water and the need for advances to make the deep water sector safer and more efficient. In BP, as you might expect, we have a comprehensive program of activity underway on deep water activities. These range from creating new standards and practices, assessing people's capabilities, and recruiting new specialists. Let me just highlight one area where we're doing a lot of work on this. It's about monitoring blowout preventers. On deep water rigs, the status of each element of the blowout preventer is monitored, and we're now working on how that data might be presented using advanced diagnostic tools and an interface along the lines of the one shown here makes the data accessible in a new way to well site leaders and managers onshore as well as the engineers on the rig. We're also working to make deep water activity more efficient by expanding the scale of the subsea systems. These systems separate oil and gas at the seabed rather than at the platform. They can also pump the resources from point to point underwater. This image shows the complex systems designed for the Pezvlor project that we're operating in Angola. Let me conclude by drawing together just a few key points that arise from the story of a century or more of frontier engineering. First, demand has driven energy production to frontier after frontier, given that fossil fuels are naturally declining resource and the unrelenting growth in demand, we would expect that process to continue. Second, sound technology innovation driven by the market has generated a stream of new opportunities accompanied by new engineering standards and design codes. But third, risk has been ever-present. We have an overriding commitment to excellence in operational risk management and the safety that results from it. This is all the more important in an industry that faces a succession of new frontiers where we have to learn as we progress. Generally, we've been both innovative and successful in managing the risks involved, but in some cases, accidents have been the driver for change. After the Piper Alpha disaster, the UK introduced the safety case modeled on Lord Hinton's work, was instrumental in developing for nuclear projects. After the Exxon Valdez spill, the United States introduced the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. And in a similar way, the USS Thresher submarine disaster led to the Nuclear Navy's subsafe program. And as I mentioned, the U.S. Nuclear Navy has been a source of learning for BP in its safety initiatives over the last year. Changes have been made after accidents and disasters have often been about creating independent and expert scrutiny and challenge. And that is exactly what we're doing in BP last year, and I believe the industry will see changes regulatory-wise. As the legendary U.S. Admiral Hyman Rickover said, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. Given this history... And in no way minimizing BP's particular responsibilities, I think it is time for our whole sector to consider whether we need to take a collective step forward in instituting stronger systems of checks and balances, scrutiny and challenge at an industry level. That, I think, is for another discussion and a different forum. For tonight, I hope this brief journey through the history of the oil industry has provided some food for thought for you and the industries that you come from. 
And in particular, I hope that I have left you in no doubt that BP is determined to implement the lessons of the past year, play our part in enabling our industry to continue to meet the challenges of engineering at the frontiers of energy. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.